You've heard it said, Paul had a thorn in his flesh at some sickness. He was sick, he couldn't get healed, and maybe you have some problem and it's your thorn in the flesh, just like he did. Look at what, are you better than Paul? You've heard that said, but I say unto you, uh-uh, nope. This thorn in the flesh was people and I can prove it. And that's what I'm gonna do today. Let's look at this verse, starting out. Because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, for this reason, to keep me from exalting myself, or in the NET becoming arrogant or conceited, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me, to keep me from exalting myself. Concerning this, I implored the Lord three times that it might leave me, or to take it away in the NIV. And he has said unto me, God said, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is perfected in weakness. Most gladly therein, I'd rather boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ can dwell within me. Therefore, I'm well content with weaknesses, with insults, with distresses, with persecution, with difficulties, for Christ's sake. For when I'm weak, then I'm strong. Now, this phrase of thorn in the flesh has came to mean something in our day and time. And here's what's interesting. It meant something back then. We'll talk about it in a little bit about the construction of the phrase, but first, let's look at this. Paul, we know, was a Bible scholar. He was an Old Testament scholar. That's why in his writings, he brings up all this old stuff. It's really great. But let's look at where this idea of thorn in the flesh is in Scripture. Because if this is a concept that's in Scripture, in the Old Testament, that was common in their day to mean something, then when Paul uses it, he's probably using it the biblical way, the way that they were doing in their culture, and not whatever some faithless person tells you it means. So let's look at these verses here. This thorn in the flesh usage of scripture, look here, we got Numbers 33. But if you don't drive the inhabitants of the land from before you, it shall come about that those whom you let remain of them will become as pricks in your eyes and thorns in your side, and they will trouble you. It's a they. How about Joshua 23, 13? Know with certainty that the Lord your God will not continue to drive these nations out from before you, and they will be a snare and a trap, whip on your sides and thorns in your eyes until you perish off from this good land which your Lord has given you. Judges, therefore I said, I will not drive them out before you, but they will become as thorns in your sides, and their gods will be a snare to you. And there will be no more, in Ezekiel here, for the house of Israel, a prickling briar or a painful thorn from any around them of those who scorned them, for they will know I'm the Lord God. And in Micah, <laughs> in Micah over here, the best of them will be like a briar, the most upright like a thorn hedge. The day when you put in your watchman, your punishment will come. In all these verses, we see this idea that this thorn in the flesh, the thorn was people. It's not a literal thorn in the flesh. It always describes something that would be bothersome, that would be a nuisance, that would be trouble, like a thorn in your flesh. We might say today kind of like a hangnail or something, you know, where it's just something annoying that's there and bugging you. And that's the term. And these aren't the only, there's more scriptures about this. But look at if Paul is an Old Testament scholar and they're using this kind of language, when he uses it for his terminology in this analogy here, He's probably talking about this. But besides that, there's more. Let's look forward. Now let's look at, people will say, here's the question in the claim. People say, oh, is Paul's thorn a sickness or a physical ailment? Because it's thorn in the flesh, right? So what do we think of? Well, we think of the flesh. But look at this, look at this, okay? In this phrase, thorn in the flesh, this word thorn, is that literal? Is he talking about a literal thorn? No, it's obviously not a literal thorn in his flesh because he could pull it out and then it wouldn't be a problem anymore, right? So thorn is figurative. We know it's a figure of speech. He's not talking about an actual thorn. But flesh, do we think that is literal? What these people are claiming is they say this is literal, but this is figurative. Does, does anybody, especially someone who's brilliant like Paul, who's educated, who's very well-spoken, ever mix these metaphors like this? Like, it's like me saying, like, it's, if I'm trying to compare apples and bananas, right? And I'm just talking about how they're different. But then if I said to you, oh my gosh, man, it's like comparing apples and oranges. You might say, 
okay, yeah, okay, Brad, we get it. Apples and oranges is like a phrase, but couldn't you be a little more clear? Couldn't you speak a little better and say some other comparison, like oil and water or something? Because if you're using the same word to try to make an analogy, it can be confusing. And Paul is a pretty brilliant guy. So in this case, for people to even think that thorn in the flesh means, oh, that it's thorn being, being just not a thorn, it's something else, but then flesh not, that kind of doesn't make any sense. We don't do that in language, and neither did they. But for whatever reason, for hundreds of years, and then especially even in the healing movement and stuff, people still make this same mistake. Why? How? But that's okay, because we ain't going to make it anymore. And if this thing even gets to stand the light of day, it's our fault for not telling them. But let's look some more. Let's look at some more questions, because this whole passage really shows more that if we just look at it logically and realistically, it all makes sense. So here's the idea. Why was the thorn allowed in that verse, okay? If we say, why was the thorn allowed? The thing that God says was because of the surpassing greatness of the revelation to keep him from exalting himself. This thorn was allowed, this thorn is there so that the revelations he was getting wouldn't make Paul prideful. Now, So if the problem was potentially being proud or exalting yourself from revelations, how is a sickness going to do that? It wouldn't. It doesn't. Like, if you're brilliant, but you got a runny nose, you're still brilliant, right? But what it actually was, what the thorn was, which we'll see here, um, which a lot of people have talked about, but, you know, when we go through these questions here, there's going to be no doubt in your mind exactly what this is or exactly who this is. But here's the idea, right? Paul is a brilliant dude. And when you're a brilliant guy, then where would your pride be coming from? It'd be come from, I got these revelations. People love it. They're following around. And then someone can get a big head when they're full of knowledge. And a lot of churches today, a lot of people, they they stay away from school because they think, oh, that makes someone too smart. Or if there's a Christian who's done school and knows something, they feel like they need to not like it. Or that they say, oh, these people are proud or whatever. This ridiculous stuff. But that can be a potential thing if somebody doesn't have grace, humility, patience, and God will have situations to help grow those things in us. But he doesn't use sickness like that anywhere in scripture. But here we see that it was to keep him from exalting himself, which as somebody who's intelligent and wise, getting appreciation and popularity could happen. But let's see here then. So what is it? If, is it a sickness? Do we think that, that Paul would pray that a sickness be taken away and he couldn't do it? That the Holy Spirit in him couldn't heal it? If clothes get taken from him in prayer cloths and that heals people, we don't think it wouldn't work on him too? And now look at like the other thing is this. We already saw that this passage is used for people in Scripture. This thorn in the flesh is people. And in the verse, we see that it actually has that kind of terminology. So it says, so who is the thorn then? Who is the thorn? People or a person who are being a nuisance and persecuting him. Remember, he calls it thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan. And then it talks about the, they would say in the one language, buffeting them or coming after them. So the idea is most likely these were people or a person who would be following him around when he's preaching, when he's teaching all this stuff and causing trouble. They're going around, they're trying to lie, trying to cause division, trying to bring him in. And Paul's like, this person is like a hassle here. This person is causing trouble. What's the deal? Guy's like, God, take it away. And God's like, no, man, check it out. My strength, my awesomeness is made perfect when you aren't Mr. Perfect on the show. And it's so awesome and wild. So here's the other thing. So look at, here's what else we see. In this verse at the end, Paul mentions these other things that he's proud of. He's saying, I'm going to boast in my weakness. So the power of Christ is there. And then he lists a couple of things. Now look at the things he lists and notice that all these things come from the hand of people. We see weaknesses. Now that could be either one, that word weakness and infirmity. It basically would mean, it could mean a sickness, right? Or it could mean just a frailty. Other places in scripture, it just means out of your humanity. Um, 
So it's weakness could be either one, but look at insults, right? If you got like some flesh wound, that's not insulting you, but he's listing insults or distresses. Could be either one, but these are distresses coming from people. Persecutions can like, oh my gosh, can like an eye infection persecute you? No, he's still talking about the stuff that's done by people and then other difficulties, right? So he's talking, he's giving all these things out that I'd be fine going through these things because then when I'm in this weak human place, God's power and his message is shown that much more. That's what he's saying here. It's so wild that we've taken this as some kind of limiting human thing. But if we know the new covenant, if we know the baptism of the Holy Spirit, if we know the finished work of Jesus Christ, then most of these verses that we think limit us, separates from God, we got it all wrong. And they came from churches who had it all wrong, and they came from denominations and parts in history where they didn't rock the Holy Spirit. They didn't have the baptism. They weren't prophesying, praying in tongues, healing the sick. So of course they're going to screw up scripture. The problem is, is that we come in, we come in in our day, and then we got some of those things and we just have to make sure that we weed them out. We just weed them out. We just throw them. We just get rid of them. And then we keep our own path straight, right? But let's look here some more. Okay, so now look at some people say, okay, it's a physical infirmity. And they point to other verses like when he's in Galatians and he's saying, um, look at there's because of a physical illness, I proclaim the gospel to you. And through my physical condition, you didn't despise me or reject me. And then another place and then Galatians, he says, see, look at the big letters I write to you with my own hand. And then elsewhere, a church, he says, you would have plucked out your own eye and given it to me. And people are like, oh, well, maybe it's some eye sickness. Maybe it's some eye disease then. But look at like if you are getting beat and we're talking actually physically persecuted, whipped, right? Stoned, all of these things, not some illness walking around with this thing, right? This would be like if his body is going through stuff. Imagine he goes to the church and he just got literally stoned and beat by these people. So he's coming in all bruised and bloody with bandages on to preach the gospel. Some people could be like, eh, I don't want to hear about that. But then boom, healed. Boom, check it out. And then they get the gospel, right? So that's what he's talking about here. And look at just writing these big letters, this verse here. When you just read the next couple of verses, and I'm going to do a whole thing on Galatians because Galatians is so good. It's so good when you got this baptism of the Holy Spirit thing and when you know the new covenant. Without those two, people get the weirdest ideas about Galatians. It's crazy. But in this one here where he's like, look at these big letters I write to you. And then some people, they just throw it in this box. They cherry pick and they say, oh, look at He had to write with really big letters because he has bad eyesight because Paul's the blind now. Oh, my gosh. No. He says right after that, he says, look, at I'm writing these big letters to you. And then he says, these other people, the people who were coming to the Galatian church, they like to make a big show of how they do things. He's using these big letters to teach this analogy of how they are so proud or lost stuff to show others. And Paul's saying, you don't need that. It's like right there. And there's so, it's so wild. So many preachers and teachers just took that idea, just repeat it, and they don't even read the context. I got to read the context and you better too. Now let's see what else here. Here's the other idea. God said that his power is made perfect in this weakness, that his power is perfected and that perfected is like made complete in the weakness. But look at here, God's power is what heals the sick. God's power is that life-giving spirit, the strength, right? This empowering, this quickening. So if he's talking here saying that, his power is perfected, and by that, you know, made complete. His power is really shown in weakness. If that means that his power is completed and perfected when you're sick, then that's two different things because Jesus was anointed with the Holy Ghost and power to go and kick the devil out and to heal all that were oppressed. And it's the power of God that is the gospel and that is salvation. So it wouldn't make any sense in this verse when we read that line, if God's saying that my power is perfected when you don't get healed by my power. That makes no sense. That's ridiculous. So with this context, with these verses, with all these things, look at how is it even possible for this to be some kind of sickness? Only if you mistake this word flesh and you think that means flesh and that makes it sickness, even though the thorn is whatever your faithless preacher told you thorn was. And if you think the power and the completion and all these things that are done and the messenger of Satan is like an eye disease or something, they're taking one of the biggest problems with all this stuff, not only for healing stuff, for power of God, for the kingdom, is when we take metaphor and make it literal. 
or if we take something that's supposed to be literal and we make it metaphorical. And all the doctrine, all the stuff we miss is due to that. That's why we need to be wise. We need to read scripture in context. We got to put our brain on, right, when we do it. And when we do that with this, we can see. Now look at after this talk, after all this, let's read this verse again and see if there's any doubt to what it's going on here. Because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, for this reason, to keep me from exalting myself, there is given to me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me, to keep me from exalting myself. Concerning this, I implored the Lord three times that it might lead me. And he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is perfected in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I'll boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore, I'm well content with weakness, with insults, with distresses, with persecution and difficulties for Christ's sake. For when I'm weak, then I'm strong. When he is weak, then he's strong. When you're at risk, God is there with his power and his surety. When you're in doubt, God is there with his knowledge. If you were sick, God is there with his healing. But in our human, natural, weak state, meaning, hey, we could die. Yeah, we could get hurt. We could get made fun of. We could get persecuted. All these things. It only sets up God. It only provides God a way for his power to be shown. The power of his word, the power of the gospel of the kingdom, his Holy Spirit power in you. Remember Jesus? He was going to get thrown off of the hill when he first preached. The mob came to throw him off. And what did he do? He just strolled right through and he just walked right through him. You want to see God's power, but you don't want to be put in situations where he has to rescue you? You want to see the fire fall, but you won't get up there with a bunch of prophets of Baal and challenge them. If you want to see this power, if you want to see what it's like to walk on the water, you got to get in a situation where you got to be in the storm. So look it, don't be afraid of any weakness. There's no weakness that is the end of your story. God is the author and the finisher. And whatever happens, when you're walking in faith and doing his thing, you're going to be glad it happened. As long as you're staying in faith, keeping it strong, and recognizing that it's the power of Christ in you, that him living in you, that his grace is worth it all, and it's enough. And until we get it, until we understand, go ahead and walk out. Get in positions where God's power can be shown. Because a hundred years from now, sitting in heaven, you're not going to look back and say, I'm glad my life was just boring and I didn't get to see anything special happening. You're probably going to wish that you could do today over again and tomorrow again if you didn't walk out in the abundant, giant, real faith that's burning inside you from his spirit within you. So remember, what might be your weakness is a chance for God's strength to be shown. And that's your story. I love you, and the Lord loves you. We'll see you soon. This ain't thorn in the USA. Uh-uh. You weren't here to order no thorn dog with mustard. You are a born-again Christian, not a thorn-again Christian. Thorn to be wild. And you do not have a thorn identity. Didn't you know that high fructose thorn syrup was bad for you? Well, top of the thorn into ya. Cause that ain't tooting your own thorn. <laughs> when you got the horn of gladness, come on. Well informed, not well informed.